everybody. Welcome into another message from Journey Church in Westerville. I'm Pastor Chris, and I'm so glad that you have jumped into this message today. Now, we're continuing our series through the Gospel of John. Today, we're in John chapter 13, verses 18 through 30. Now, I want you to know all the teachings stand on their own. So if this is the first message that you've seen in this series, stay with today's. It's a very serious topic that many of us have dealt with. Today I'm going to be talking about betrayal. Because the passage we're in it is the last passage before Jesus is betrayed. It's the passage where Jesus tells Judas to go quickly and do what the Lord knows is going to be done. And, and I want you to know that betrayal is one of the most painful things. It is a relationship ruiner. It's very hard to come back from and rebuild the trust. It's not impossible. But marriages are often destroyed by betrayal. I've talked to people whose love for the church and faith in the church have been destroyed because a, a pastor they know or they were uh, under betrayed them, took money from them, uh, had an affair with somebody in the church, ran off on his family. Th these are not uncommon stories. But you'll see in the passage as I read it today, Jesus lets us know that people will betray, and he's aware of that, but he never will. He, he never will. He, he's truthful, and, and he knows, and he understands. And yet there are questions that we have about betrayal. Uh, in the church, it, it's hard because I know that Jesus says that the wheat and the tares will grow up together and one day he'll separate them. I, I know that one day he'll divide the sheep from the goats. And Judas, in, in this passage, is, is going to betray and he's going to surprise all of the disciples. Matter of fact, Jesus is going to model here how to deal with it, how to handle it. And that's very helpful. I want to look at that today. But I want to tell you, I understand how hard betrayal is to come back from. People you should be able to trust that let you down. I had a very close friend throughout my college experience, a person I considered like a brother. In our senior year, I, I w had been on security. I had helped with various things on campus. And our, our senior year, I was pulled aside because the police had come in to, to search our dorm room. A store had been held up. Some things had happened. The weapon, the outfit used to conceal identity was found in our room. It was my roommate, who, who was a close and dear friend who never told me what happened. Our lives after that were very different. We became very distant. I've had a hard time over the years trusting anybody to be a close friend. I know my wife, when we first got married, I, I spent a long time trusting her because I'd had a long-term girlfriend who had gone out with other guys. I, I found out later on she had a, a summer boyfriend. It was hurtful. I understand betrayal. And yet God has been good to give me a a, a wife that truly loves me and, and is truly a wonderful friend. The Lord has been good to give me Christian friends over the year. But one thing I, I know, too, is that I let the Lord choose my friends. I let the Lord choose my wife. Uh, my aim wasn't very good. I, I've had men in, in ministry let me down. I had a, a situation the first time I, I was going to go to seminary where uh, that, let's just say one of the leaders on the campus let the entire campus down. I, I left that seminary, and it was a few years before I went again. And I'd have to say that the second time was the charm. I, I was in classes and in that school with some truly wonderful people. I have appreciated some wonderful fr professors and wonderful pastors over the years that I've never seen stray from the Lord. But I'll tell you what, once you've been betrayed, you have questions. You watch certain things. And sometimes you want to warn other people if you think there's a betrayal at hand. I've always cautioned myself against that. 
Because maybe it isn't. Maybe it looks like it to me, but there are godly ways to handle it. Listen, as I read to you about Jesus' betrayal at the Last Supper from the Gospel of John, I want you to know, in, here in John 13, 18 through 30, Jesus uh, shares some things that, that I want us to look closely at because we need to see his character. We need to see how he's dealing with it and how he approaches it. And what is, I believe, the worst betrayal in all of history? Jesus never deserved to be treated in any bad way. He had let Judas stay with him over the course of three years. Judas had seen miracles. He had seen the power of Jesus' teaching. He had sat at his feet in private places, at places where the Pharisees didn't see. When Jesus went off into the wilderness to, to teach and to coach these men, the Lord of all, the perfect one, with all the perfect words and the perfect teaching. And yet, for whatever reason, Judas didn't feel like he should be the one to usher in the kingdom. He shouldn't, Jesus shouldn't be the one to be the Messiah. And he sells him out to the leaders of the temple. The worst betrayal in history. And how do I know? I know because I've never baptized a, a young man named Judas. I've never even, I believe, seen a parent in our, our church with a, a, a child named Judas. When I was young, one of my first jobs was to work for a, a slaughterhouse one summer. And, and the Judas goat was something that I, I came to understand. The sheep would come in, there was a goat, it would walk down the ramp into the slaughterhouse and go off one direction. The sheep would begin following on that one-way ramp, and they would have to come in. The goat was happy, happy to lead them to their end. Uh, you didn't have to tell me why he was called a Judas goat. Probably as soon as I said that, even if you're not familiar with the practice, you understood that he was leading them in a bad direction. One thing I will tell you before I read this passage, I'm glad that Judas acted alone. Matter of fact, many times the private sins, the things that we do wrong in our lives are kept to ourselves and when exposed to others are disastrous. Betrayal is disastrous. An, an ender of friendships, an, an ender of relationships. And Judas is the betrayer. I'm going to read this. I'm going to come back through. And, and I'm going to share with you how I see the Lord dealing with this betrayal and preparing the disciples to handle the blow. And I'm also going to deal a little bit with how the disciples see it. I want you to learn about the character of Jesus in the very worst moments of life because that helps us. One of the realities of life is Jesus didn't come so there wouldn't be any more betrayal now. Jesus came so when we face these hard things, we have someone to help us move through and move forward. The reality is no matter how much you've been betrayed or let down or hurt, Jesus understands it. He's experienced it, and his example can help us move forward for the greater good for the greater good of our lives and the future that we can have in Christ. Because in Christ, no matter how much you've been hurt or betrayed or let down, the best is always yet to come. And why would I say the best is yet to come? Because Jesus is always yet to come. We get to experience him in spirit now, but one day you'll open your eyes and you'll see your, your Lord and Savior face to face, the best day in all of eternity will be the day you see him. I'm going to read through this, come back, give you these five points about the Lord. And my friends, I hope if you've been betrayed or been hurt by betrayal, that this will be an encouragement to you. If you get betrayed later on, come back and watch this message again. It ministers to me to read about this and to know that no matter how much I've been hurt, the Lord was hurt too. I'm not perfect. Jesus was, and he was still betrayed. I should say he is. <laughs> he is Lord forever. 
John 13, 18 through 30. I'm not speaking about all of you. I know those I have chosen, but the scriptures must be fulfilled. The one who eats my bread has raised his heel against me. I am telling you now before it happens so that when it does happen, you will believe that I am he. I assure you, whoever receives anyone I send receives me. And the one who receives me receives him who sent me. When Jesus had said this, he was troubled in his spirit and he testified, I assure you, one of you will betray me. The disciples started looking at one another, uncertain of which one he was speaking about. One of his disciples, the one Jesus loved, that's John, was reclining close beside Jesus. And Simon Peter motioned across to him, find out who it was that Jesus was talking about. So John leaned back against Jesus and asked him, Lord, who is it? And Jesus replied, he is the one I give the piece of bread to after I have dipped it. When Jesus had dipped the bread, he gave it to Judas, Simon Iscariot's son. After Judas ate the piece of bread, Satan entered into him. Therefore, Jesus told him, what you're doing, do quickly. None of those reclining at the table knew why he told him this. Since Judas kept the money bag, some thought that Jesus was telling him, buy what we need for at the festival, or that Judas should go and give something to the poor. After receiving the piece of bread, Judas went out immediately, and it was night. Now at the end of this passage, John adds it was night. We know at the Last Supper, we know the time of this meal. We know that it was night. So isn't John being a little redundant, saying Judas went out and it was night? No, because the rest of them were staying for the breaking of the bread and the drinking of the cup with Jesus. The rest of them were staying for the communion. As Jesus presented it and told about what he was going to do, the rest of them were staying for deeper teaching. They were staying with the light. But Judas was leaving to go into the night. It's poetic. It's beautiful and it's true. Judas got up and left, and it was night. It was a very dark moment of betrayal. A destroyed relationship. A moment of sadness, great sadness. So what can we learn from it? Well, to go back up at the beginning of this passage in verse 18, we're going to find Jesus quoting from Scripture. In verse 18, Jesus says, I'm not speaking about all of you. I know those I have chosen. But the Scripture must be fulfilled. The one who eats my bread has raised his heel against me. Now, in, when he, Jesus says, raised his heel against me, he's quoting from Psalm 41.9. And this is a, a psalm written by David after he has been betrayed. He has been betrayed and, and his son, Absalom, has come in and taken over the kingdom. And, and, and David has fled and he's gone up the Mount of Olives weeping, much in the way Jesus is going to be doing soon after this meal. David, the true king, anointed by the Lord, has been deposed by his own son. And and he writes about that in Psalm 41.9. He says, even my close friend, someone I trusted, one who shared my bread has raised his heel against me. It's the same thing that Jesus says. One has raised his heel. So, So who raised their heel against David? that ate his bread. This isn't talking about Absalom. David is talking about Ahithophel. Now, you may never have heard this story before, but if you study the life of of David, he had a a court, and, and in that court, he had advisors, and one of his most faithful advisors that David said spoke as if he was speaking the words of God himself was Ahithophel, an old man. An old man who had been so true and his advice had been so helpful to David. David thought they were truly friends and he had dined at his table. He had been in his inner circle. He had helped him. He had seen David do miraculous miracles, wonders, when God triumphed and and gave their enemies over to their hands. Ahithophel had seen this in much the way Judas 
saw the works of Christ. And, and yet when Absalom came in and took Jerusalem, Ahithophel left David's side and he went to begin consulting Absalom to, to take over and depose the father. Matter of fact, when David flees, Ahithophel is called on by Absalom to give advice, and Ahithophel gives advice to send a small group quickly and kill David. You'll be able to catch him if you do it now. But there's another advisor who had been sent by David, whose name was Hushai, who gives different advice, and, and Hushai's advice is there only to confound the good advice of Ahithophel. Hushai says, no, you got to take your time. you got to gather up all of Israel because David is a, a tough guy. It's not going to be easy. He's got a massive and powerful group of mighty men with him. He slows Absalom down to help his king. Ahithophel's advice actually is the true advice. So how is Ahithophel's advice defeated? Well, Absalom takes Hushai's advice, which he should not. And later, Ahithophel finds out. Finds out. And, and 2 Samuel 17, 23 reads this. When Ahithophel saw that his advice had not been followed, he saddled his donkey, set out for his house in his hometown. He put his house in order, and then he hanged himself. So he died and was buried in his father's tomb. Ahithophel is going to do exactly what Judas is going to do, and I'll tell you why. Ahithophel, when he finds out that his advice wasn't heeded, he knows right away that David is going to get the victory because he knows he gave good advice. He knows what needed to be done for Absalom's kingdom to persist, but God thwarted Absalom because it was never to be the kingdom of Absalom. Jesus was to come from the line of David, from the kingdom of David. David was the anointed king by the Lord, and no one else was going to fill that spot. Just like Jesus is the anointed king, and no one will fill his spot. And anyone opposed to him who brings their heel up against him is taking part of another kingdom. And Judas goes to get his 30 pieces from the priests at the temple. Judas, who had grown up closer to Jerusalem than the rest of the boys, who had carried the money back, who had seemed more religious, who had seemed more trustworthy than anyone else, Judas raised his heel against the Lord in just the same way Ahithophel raised his heel and, and went and advised the enemies. Judas is going to advise them. He's going to tell them uh, that who Jesus is and when the good time is to take him. He's going to identify him. But Jesus says, Scripture has to be fulfilled. Jesus came to go to the cross. He knew what he had to do. But, but the first thing I want you to know up here is, is, is Jesus isn't without choice. Judas certainly has a choice. And he makes his choice. But the Lord Jesus chose the disciples. And among those he chose was Judas. And, and you need to know that, that Judas was put in the host seat, in the, the, the best seat at the Last Supper, right next to Jesus was Judas. He was the first one to get his feet washed. I'm going to put up on the screen so you can picture what's going on at the Last Supper here, by the way. Uh, this is a a picture of the seating. You see, Jesus was sitting right between John and Judas, and, and in this passage when it says that, that Peter had to yell across to John, who is it? You see where Peter's say, sitting. Peter was sitting in the servant seat, in the, the lowest position, as they sat around the table. Judas was in the most prized position. He was in a place where you can see right next to G Jesus where he could dip. Jesus could dip bread in his bowl and, and give it to Judas. We'll get to that in a moment. It, it's important for you to see the seating, to understand the action. Jesus chose all the men around that table. And he chose to put Judas in a seat of honor, even knowing that he was going to turn his heel against him. Why would Jesus choose this and honor him? 
even though he knows. Because Jesus doesn't treat those who betray him poorly. You can't blame Jesus for treating you poorly as the reason you betray him, as the reason you turn from him, as the reason you deny him, because he wants all to come to him. Judas isn't leaving because he's treated poorly. Judas is going to leave to betray Jesus because he doesn't like God's choice. He'd rather be in good with the the wealthy, the priest, denying the Lord's choice. Scripture says it has to be done, and in a way, through the story of Ahithophel, we see that if you choose the wrong kingdom to serve, You go in a bad direction. Oh, the Lord chooses. But we have choices to make too. Why did the Lord choose? Because for whatever reason, he loved Judas and he wanted Judas to make a different choice. He treated him well. Just like David treated Ahithophel well. And Ahithophel chose the wrong kingdom. The Lord chooses choose him second thing in verses 19 and 20 it says i'm telling you now before it happens so that when it does happen you'll believe that i am he i assure you whoever receives anyone i send receives me and the one who receives me receives him who sent me jesus is saying here listen i know betrayal is going to hurt you guys i know it's going to be a shock but i want you to know before it happens when betrayal happens it's not me if you receive me i will show you truth I will turn you from betrayal. I am not like this. And when you go out as witnesses for me, represent me well. Don't betray people. Don't turn on the sacred trust. Remember, if I send you, people need to receive me, not you. You know, we're bearers of Christ. As a pastor, Ministry is about bearing him, telling people about how wonderful he is, not telling you how wonderful I am. I am not somebody to put up on a pedestal. Jesus is. And even when betrayal happens, know that he gives you the encouragement that it wasn't him. He turns from from saying, I chose you. I chose you. I even love the betrayer, the one who turns his heel against me. It's not me that's doing it. It's him. And and just know before it happens that you can trust me. You really do have a friend in Jesus. His word, when you pick it up, it never changes. It always consoles you. It always encourages you. And Jesus is telling them before it happens, there's going to be a betrayer. So when it happens, they remember these words that Jesus is not the betrayer. He told them the truth. He gave them encouragement. He gave them something rock solid in him that they can hold on to. Because when you're betrayed, you're hurt. And you need the presence and power of Christ. You need the solid nature of of scripture to help you through listen when i've been hurt in my life one thing i do is i get driven to scripture to study it and it consoles me not because it doesn't show how terrible people are but because it does show how terrible people are and how god loves and has mercy for them anyway it's amazing to me how merciful jesus is to someone he knows is betraying him and has been planning it for a while and his heart has been far from him and he's been dirty but jesus still puts him in a place of honor and cares for him wanting him to make a different decision because you can never believe jesus or never blame jesus for your lostness he's been good to you because the lord is good and he seeks to save all he's not trying to beat judas into submission he's trying to love him into his kingdom what's the third thing on the list here jesus chooses he knows and he is moved in verse 21 it says when jesus had said this he was troubled in his spirit and he testified i assure you one of you will betray me he's not happy about betrayal it shakes jesus too isn't it good to know that god is shaken and has a heart he's not some giant power in the sky that doesn't care he grieves and if you go through scripture over and over again in scripture when when god heard his people cry out to him and when they were bound in egypt he, he his heart was turned towards his people listen he's 
not an immovable object. He cares for you. He has a heart he loves. Jesus is troubled. He's heartbroken over betrayal. But even in his heartbrokenness, he makes good decisions. I, I love this. When Jesus says, one of you will, uh, they're perplexed. Uh, the, in verse 22, it says, the disciples started looking around at one another, uncertain. At another translation of this Greek word is perplexed. They're out of words. They don't know what to say. And they're all wondering, which one of us? Which one of us? They're all worried it may be them in some way, and they don't want to do it because their hearts are true. You know, there's only one person in this room who isn't worried about betraying Jesus, and that's Judas, because he doesn't care. I don't think he ever loved Jesus. When Mary went to to put the, uh, broke the alabaster jar and put the fragrance, the perfume on his feet to anoint him for his death, Judas said, shouldn't that have been sold? And money put in the bag. And John notes he just wanted to steal the money. He didn't love Jesus. When you love somebody, you don't care how much money goes into the gift. You want to give to them extravagantly out of love. And Mary gave him the best thing she had because she loved him, not because she was counting the cost. He said he was going to his death, and she had something to to give to somebody that she loves about their death. You don't count the cost in a great gift, but Judas was counting the cost because he didn't have love in his heart. He's not worried about being one of the betrayers. I, I love the fact that the disciples are concerned. It shows their love. It shows the the fact that they don't want to even accidentally betray Jesus in some way. They're so careful about the relationship. Matter of fact, the passage just before this, when when Jesus tells Peter, if I don't wash your feet, you'll have no part with me. Peter immediately says, wash all of me. And Jesus says, your heart's clean. I don't need to wash in there. You love me. But let me take care of this practical thing about washing your feet. It needs to be done to come to the table with me. Uncertain of which one he was speaking about, one of the disciples, the one Jesus loves, this is John, was reclining close beside Jesus. And Simon Peter, you saw from the picture, motioned all the way across the table, hey, hey, John, catch this, catch this, who is it? John tenderly leaned into Christ and asked him. And Jesus told him. You know, Jesus is moved in his heart and his the ones that loved him were moved in their hearts because betrayal hurts. And it hurts a person who wants to be true. Listen, in my life, one of the things that I've noticed is sometimes when somebody's betrayed, they're so hurt and so shocked by it, but later they have a hard time being friends or connecting and they're more likely to become a betrayer themselves. It is important to stay true. And, and I love their concern. They couldn't believe that somebody in their midst, somebody who had seen the things they had seen. And and John had seen, they had seen the transfiguration where Jesus glowed. And God spoke to them. No matter what the world thought of Jesus, they knew he was Lord. And they loved him. Not so with Judas. Judas. I don't know if Judas didn't think Jesus was good enough or rich enough or spoke well enough or was in with the leaders of the temple enough or he just couldn't leave this old world. But man, I love Jesus was moved in the heart and so were those that were true hearts. And they just wanted to know, is it going to be me? Who's it going to be? We need to deal with this now for the betterment of what we're dealing with. And Jesus replied, he's the one I give the piece of bread to. You know, it's amazing to me. In in Romans 12, 20 and 21, it says this, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not become, do not overcome, do not become overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And, and where, where did the writer of Romans get this? From Jesus right here. Jesus said, I'm going to give him a piece of bread that I dip. I'm going to feed him. 
I'm going to care for him. I'm going to love him. Matter of fact, in Romans 12, 20 and 21, that passage is being quoted from Psalm 25, 21 and 22, the writings of David. We have two examples here from David's writing, the heel raised against him, the, the caring for his enemy. How did Jesus treat his enemy and betrayer? He treated him with love, feeding him with out of his hand, out of his own bowl. He loved him. He was moved by it. He was sad. He knew the disciples would be too. The Lord is kind to all. Don't ever let somebody tell you the reason they don't want to accept Jesus is because he hasn't been good. Maybe life has beaten them up. Maybe other people have betrayed them. But Jesus has always wanted to be good to them and tried in some way to reach them. And it's not because Judas here is unreachable that Jesus writes him off. We would do that. Jesus continues to reach out to Judas. I'll tell you why. Because that's the character of Christ. Regardless of what the character of the sinner is, the character of our God is good and holy and to reach out. Don't let anybody ever tell you God's character is evil in any way. God is good. And his son, our Savior, was good even to his betrayer. And he was feeding him. And he told the guys, I, I, hey, I'm going to feed him. I'm going to care for him. I'm going to love him. And, and then after Judas ate, after he was fed by the very hand of the Savior, Satan entered in and he left. And Jesus said, do it quickly. Like a Band-Aid, rip it off. Listen, my wife sometimes is slow taking the Band-Aid off the kids, but I rip it off. Just go get it done. It's painful. It's hard. Jesus says, do what you will. You know, we're given free will. I, I've had people say to me before, well, pastor, this can't be sin because the Lord hasn't stopped me. He sent Judas and told him to go fast, and that was sin. Betraying Jesus, egregious sin. On a level unlike any other betrayal. Do it quickly. Is God saying this sin's okay? Listen, is the Bible saying it's okay because it, it said it would happen? No, the Bible knows what's going to happen. The Lord knows what's going to happen, and he gives that to prophets, and they write it down. But it doesn't mean the Lord wanted it. It doesn't mean the Lord enjoyed it. It doesn't mean the Lord made a bad choice. He loved Judas, even though Judas had the power to reject him. The Lord wanted good for him and continued to call him. Listen, Jesus chooses, and I hope you've chosen him back with your whole heart. Not just because you needed something or just for a little while or just for a friend at church or just so you could marry somebody who said they were a believer. I hope you really love Jesus because he knows who's playing and who's playing in religion and who's messing around and who's making themselves look good and who really loves him. The Lord chooses to love all he can. But we also have choices to make. The Lord knows who's going to betray him, but he continues to love them and give them good things. Why? Because that's his character. The Lord is moved when people go the wrong way. Why? Because he truly loves and wants us all home. Jesus is going to give a gift at the cross for all so that all could be saved and covered by him. But our world tries to make Jesus look like the bad guy. And God's kingdom look unfit and hidden. It's ridiculous. Jesus is kind, even to his enemies, and he instructs us to do likewise. Feed them. Care for them. Why? They hate you. But the character of God is to want to reach them with his love. I want to give you the last thing. Verse 28 through 30. None of those reclining at the table knew why Jesus told him this. Since Judas kept the money bag, some thought that Jesus was telling him, buy what you need for the festival, or that he should give something to the poor. And after receiving the piece of bread, Judas went out immediately, and it was night. Listen, the, the disciples were told, the one who dips his bread, and Jesus dipped the bread, but they still didn't get it. Why didn't they get it? Because they thought Judas was the best one of all of them. He was in the honor seat at the Last Supper. He was being sent out alone. They were generally sent out in pairs. He held the money bag, which is very trustworthy. Judas was likely 
from a slightly higher class of people than the, the rest of the disciples. He wasn't a fisherman. He wasn't a, a, a tax collector, a money changer. It continually, the passages mention his dad, Simon Iscariot's son, probably came from a good family. He probably looked good. He, was, he grew up closer to Jerusalem than the rest of them. They thought he was this great guy who had this wonderful inn with the Lord. So even though the Lord said somebody's going to betray him, he's going to dip their head, they didn't see it. Because they said, but, but he's got the money bag. The Lord trust him. And, and Jesus is sending him out to do some important task because they thought a lot of Judas. Listen, when, when I was in college, when I finally broke up with my girlfriend, I had several of my friends say to me, I'm so glad she was no good for you. And I said, why didn't you tell me? And they said, because you loved her. And that hurt. That hurt, and that's when I realized I shouldn't be in total control of the choices in my life. I need to trust the Lord because he can guide me in the right ways because only he can see somebody's heart. Only he could see inside of Judas' heart, but we can't. We're going to miss it. We're going to be betrayed, and it's not because the Lord doesn't sometimes try to tell us or help us or guide us or lead us. It's because sometimes we see what we want to see, and the disciples here see what they want to see. This great guy who had been with them the whole time, they couldn't believe that he would be the one. They were worried that it was them because they thought they didn't match up. But the guy that thought he was so great that he could test the Lord that maybe Jesus wasn't it. There had to be a better way. There had to be somebody that got along with the guys at the temple. Like he wanted to get along with the guys at the temple. Judas was wrong. He picked the wrong kingdom. He should have stayed with Jesus. The disciples are going to stay with Jesus. And in our next message, and I hope you'll come back and listen to the next one. In the next one, Peter's going to be tested. He's going to be told that he's going to fail. He's going to ask the Lord, well, will I really make it? And I hope you'll come back as we continue through this series. But I want you to know, in your life and mine, sometimes we're betrayed, but we can't see it. Because we can't truly look inside. The Lord can't show you because you had a fixed perspective. But the Lord chooses to, to, to call people to him. The Lord knows that some will betray him. And the Lord has moved in his heart about that and it makes him sad, but the Lord is still kind even to the betrayers. And you can't show somebody else who's betraying them and, and sometimes the Lord can't show you. But we can choose to stay close to him and we can choose his kingdom and we can choose, like the disciples did, to search ourselves and say, Lord, not me. I don't want it to be me. I want you to have chosen me, and I want to choose you back. I want you to, to know me and know my true motives, that I love you. I, I want you to be moved not by how much I'm going to turn away from you, but how much I'm going to turn to you. Lord, I want your kindness to matter because I appreciate your mercies. I don't reject them. And Lord, you can't show people how much I love you right now, but I hope one day that they'll see. Because even a sinner like me is home when he loves the Lord, when she loves the Lord, when we love the Lord, when you love the Lord. Listen, I don't know what kind of Bible preacher or teacher I am. But I'll tell you this, my friends. I love the Lord. I love him. I don't want to ever betray him. And I hope you feel the same way. No matter how much we've been betrayers or been betrayed, Lord, help us not to be betrayers. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this time and this word, and I hope somebody listened to it that needed it. I hope somebody uh, maybe writes down a couple of points or, or ponders over it in their heart. Lord, you knew who the betrayer was, but nobody else did, and it caused everybody to think through the importance of staying true. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that you would help us to, to come to you, to love you, and to not be playing games, but be true to you. One day you will separate the sheep from the goats. You will separate the, the wheat from the tares. And Lord, I pray that, that you would change our hearts so we would truly be cleansed on the inside by Christ and we would be your sheep. We would be your wheat. 
and we would be home with you. Father, for anyone who has been betrayed and hurt and given up and walked away, help them to see it wasn't you. That you love them and you want to give them a lighted path home in out of the dark to be with you. Help us to love you. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Well, my friends, that's all I have. If I had more, I give it more. <laughs> I tell you more. I, I thought that was going to be a really short message, but it's a little longer than some have been lately. So I, I, I'm really thankful if you stayed through to the end. Uh, this one touched my heart. And, and I hope if you're in the area and come out to Journey, uh, if you reach out to me, any prayer requests, anything I can do to help you, I will. I, I hope that if you're in the area and come out, and I hope to see you soon.